Today it's about grace rejected. Our gospel lesson from Luke chapter 20, which is on page uh, 1633, is our foundation of where we're going to be going today. But Jesus told a specific parable targeted at a specific group of people, and that parable was uh, a story about the owner rejected. Now you may think about it and says, wait a minute, the owner rejected? The story says there was a bunch of servants involved. Yes, there were. But when one rejects the servants, you reject the owner. Think about it a minute. The treatment of the servants. What was their job? What were they supposed to do? Well, we look at the parable, he says, in, right there in verse 9, a man planted a vineyard, rented it to some farmers, and went away for a long time. The key phrase is, rented it to some farmers. Now, if you are renting a house or renting an apartment, do you not owe the owner, the landlord, your rent? Of course you do. That's part and parcel of living. And, and do you not, when you own a house, if you haven't paid your house off yet, do you not owe the bank? Of course you do. Well, here are these farmers who were rented out this piece of property that the owner sent his servants to say, where's my rent? The treatment of the servants were, as we look at it, abysmal at best. They beat one and sent him away empty-handed. The second one, they treated shamefully and beat. The third one, they wounded him and threw him out. These tenants, these people who were on the land of the owner, not only treated the servants shamefully, but by means of treating the servants shamefully, also treated the owner with shame and indignance. They're basically saying, ha! You can't do anything about this. Why? Well, it was because of the arrogance and greed. The arrogance and the greed. They wanted to keep it all for themselves. They wanted something for nothing. They wanted all that they had. They wanted all the profits. They wanted all the produce. They did not want to give the owner tribute or honor or anything else for the fact that he was letting them live on their land and work the land. They thought it belonged to them. In other words, they thought it was their inheritance. If we look at what their response, when the owner sends his son in verse 14, but when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. Which is really an interesting point of view if you think about it. Here are tenants thinking that they owned it. Or else they wouldn't even think they would be getting inheritance. So for them it was inheritance lost. They lost it all. The owner came and kicked them off the, the ground. The owner came. And whatever they thought they were going to get out of all of this, they didn't. Like I said earlier, Jesus told this parable to a specific set of people so let's take a look at the hearers of this. And we find this, the hearers are the priests, scribes, and elders. The priests, the scribes, and the elders. This is, this is the time. When, when is this happening? After Palm Sunday. This is the week between, whether it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, or the beginning of Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday. 
What were they looking for? They were looking for evidence, evidence by which to put Jesus to death. And Jesus is sharing this parable with them to point out that, hey, you know what? You guys are the tenants. If we look at the second half of verse 16 and following, when the people heard this, they said, may this never be. That's not us. We don't treat people shamefully. And Jesus' point after that is, then tell me the meaning of that which is written, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. Everyone on who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. Oh, they knew. Once they heard that, then they began to realize what the Israelite people did to the messengers of God. Think about it for a moment. The nation of Israel has been rejecting the grace of God for centuries. They've been thinking it's all about them. It's all about, wow, look at me. We're the promised ones. We've been given this wonderful land. Now it's mine. They had totally forgotten who gave it to them. And then when God tried to get them to turn around and repent of their sins, receive the grace and renew their lives, God sent to them the prophets, prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Elijah, Elisha, and many others. What was their response to God's chosen messenger saying, turn around, repent of your sins? What did they do? They put a good number of them to death. They chose, we're not listening to y'all. For example, Jeremiah. Jeremiah is going to the priests He's going to the elders. He's going to the leaders. He's even going to the king of Judah. He's going to them, and if you don't repent, this is what God's going to do. God is going to remove you from your land. God will take you away from that which you hold most dear. They chose to listen to the other voices. God's not going to do that. God's going to bless you. So what do they do with Jeremiah? They threw him in a dry well and left him there. They knew. They knew not only what Jesus was saying, but why. The hearers. Not only are the priests, the scribes, and the elders, but they're also the people. They're the people also who are also trapped in their sin, trapped in their way of life, trapped without knowing the grace of God that was standing right in front of them. And then there's one more, one more hearer that's not listed in our text. It's us. We're one of the final hearers. And the question that we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus really talking to us? Are we rejecting the grace? Have we rejected the prophet saying to us, repent and turn away from your sins, and when you do, you will receive grace and mercy to renew your lives? Have we turned our backs on that? And to make it worse, have we crucified the Son of God? Yes, we did. It was our sins that put him there. It was not just the sins of the people that Jesus was speaking to at that moment. It was ours as well. We put him there. And thanks be to God, 
he stayed there. For through his crucifixion, our wounds have been healed. Through his crucifixion and his blood shed, the body and blood of Jesus set us here in and with the bread and wine of Holy Communion today. The blood of Jesus is what sa- saves us from our sins and our sinfulness, our arrogance, our greed. God saves us through Jesus. We have to talk about also the impact of what Jesus is saying. The impact of anger, fear, and murder. The impact of anger. That's not me. No, Jesus, what are you talking about? That can't be me. No, not at all. No way. Uh Uh-uh. Well, usually when we respond in anger, according to a professor that I uh, spent time with, anger is a secondary emotion, meaning that there is another emotion that drives the anger. But what is that? Fear. Fear drives anger the vast majority of the time. So we have to ask ourselves, Of what are we afraid? That we would respond in anger at Jesus saying, no. I think what we're afraid most of all is the fact of the matter is that Jesus is right. We have not listened to his messengers. We have not listened to him. We have in many and various ways, rejected the grace, which then leads to murder. And I'm not saying murder in the sense that we've actually killed somebody. That's not what I'm referring to. What I'm referring to is the murder that Jesus says we commit on a day-to-day basis. For Jesus says, if you get angry at someone, Basically, that anger says, I just want to wring his neck. You've already committed murder in your heart. Oh, he makes me so angry. You've already committed murder in your heart. That's the impact of grace rejected. But the beautiful thing about it is all is not lost. All is not lost. As we look what Jesus says, when he says in verse 17, Jesus looked directly at them and asked, then is the meaning of that which is written, the the stone the builders has rejected has become the capstone. The capstone, also known as the cornerstone, or also known as Jesus is the foundation. Jesus is the foundation. He is that corner on which everything else is built square and true and vertical and upright. Jesus is the cornerstone of you and me. Jesus is the cornerstone of his church, his people. Yes, sometimes he has to chastise his own church. Yes, sometimes he has to say to the church, excuse me. And the church then responds, I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? The church responds with repentance, coming to God with a contrite heart, humble only to be lifted up by what Jesus says. I forgive you. Comforted and lifted up and strengthened by the grace. Jesus is the foundation of everything. Jesus also is, Jesus' rejection is our salvation. Think about it a minute. If Jesus was not to be rejected then where will we be? Jesus was rejected. He was 
stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God so that we would not be. Jesus' rejection was for our salvation and our forgiveness. Jesus' rejection as a teacher, Jesus' rejection as a leader, Jesus' rejection as the Messiah himself showed to us that he is the Messiah. Let's think about it in this way. Jesus is hanging upon the cross. The Pharisees and the scribes and the priests are all standing in front of the crosses and they're saying to Jesus mockingly, if you are the Son of God, come down off that cross and we'll believe in you. They were hoping for a miracle, much like Herod tried to ply Jesus for a miracle. They were hoping for a miracle in their own minds. You know what the miracle was? There was a miracle that happened on that Good Friday. The miracle was that he stayed on that cross. He took our punishment. He took that which belonged to us because we are sinful people and he gave us grace. All is not lost. God has given you and I grace and mercy and peace. The, the capstone, the foundation, the life of Christ is our It is ours to receive. And as we receive the grace and the mercy that is Christ Jesus our Lord, let us renew our lives. Renew our lives on a day-to-day, moment-by-moment basis. Let us renew our hearts and our minds to focus on Christ and his life for us so therefore we can go forth in acceptance of the grace receiving it with joy, receiving it with love as God wondrously gave. In Jesus' name, amen.